Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire. The announcement last evening that Ranil Wickremesinghe will be the new Prime Minister of Sri Lanka has taken the island by surprise. Is it an inspired choice because of his considerable experience? After all, he's been Prime Minister five times earlier. Or has the President, by this one decision, complicated an already very difficult and tense situation? That's the key issue I should raise today with the founding executive director of Sri Lanka Center for Policy Alternatives, Dr. Paikyasothi Saravanamuthu. Dr. Saravanamuthu, let's start with the surprise announcement made fairly late yesterday evening that Ranil Vikramasinghe, a five-time former prime minister, has been appointed prime minister by President Gotabaya Rajapaksha. Is Vikramasinghe the right choice at this critical moment? Or has the president complicated an already very difficult situation with this appointment? Well, let's look at the pros and cons of Vikram Singh's appointment. The pros are that, yes, he's being appointed for the sixth time as prime minister. He has a wealth of experience and expertise in terms of dealing with both bilateral and multilateral institutions. And particularly, he is seen as being pro-Western in terms of his outlook. And therefore, that might be important as far as us attracting the bridging finance that we need before we get the deal with the IMF. The cons are, of course, is, is that Mr. Vikramasinghe has never been a popular politician. He's seen as someone who is a deal maker. He's seen as someone who has protected the Rajapaksas from uh, convictions and indictments. Um, and so... In that respect, he lacks a certain amount of public credibility. In 2019, at the sorry, in 2020, at the general election, his party did not win any seats. It managed to get on the proportional representation basis one nationalist seat, and that's the seat that Mr. Vikramasinghe occupies. So obviously, the agreement with President Rajapaksa is that he, Mr. Vikramasinghe, will be supported by the 148-odd members of parliament of the president's party, the Sri Lanka Podujara Perumana. Um, so he is then going to be the single UNP MP who is the prime minister, supported by the president's party. Now, if he succeeds economically in getting things back on course, and he has said that the reason why he's taking the job is because the economy is in a parlous condition, then, of course, a certain amount of kudos will accrue to him and it will also praise, uh, save the president's skin, if you like, politically as well. But if he fails, then, of course, he is the only UNP MP in parliament. He and his party will take the responsibility for that. In a sense, politically, one can argue that President Rajapaksa has um, scored a minor win insofar as He's now shifted the focus to Ranil Vikramasinghe, his government, and his ability to take us out of the political situation. However, the protesters are continuing, and their argument remains that Gotabe Rajpaksa must leave politics, his family, and he must return the wealth that they allege that the Rajpaksas have stolen. So whilst Ranil might want to focus and concentrate on the economy, the political reforms of getting rid of the executive presidency, of getting rid of the Rajpaksas, are also very much on the agenda. You've given us a lot of things to talk about in that wonderful first answer, and I'll pick up on a lot of them one by one in a moment's time. But first, let me focus a little on the way Ranul Vikramasanga is perceived I noticed that Cardinal Malcolm Ranjit said the following, people want a person with integrity, not someone who has been defeated in politics. How much weight will that fairly derisory comment from the Cardinal carry with the Sri Lankan people? Well, to the extent that the Cardinal is in control of his flock, I suppose it will carry a certain amount of weight. But I think the jury is out. If Ranil Vikramasinghe is able to put the economy back on track, then I think he will be forgiven for whatever lapses or 
whatever defects he's supposed to have in his political persona, you know. So, yes, he divides opinion. There is no two ways about that. Before I come to the economic challenges and how he's going to tackle them, let's talk a little bit about his own political position. As you pointed out, he failed to win a seat in the elections of 2020. He only got into parliament through the national list, which is through proportional representation. And he's therefore the only member of his party, the UNP. Now, you've said that he will draw support from the Rajapaksa's SLPP. But will he, in addition also, A, try to split Sajid Premadasa's SJP? And will he also hope for support from the SLFP? Will Sirisena, who he served under as prime minister, also support him? Well, before the announcement of his, of his premiership was made, there were certain suggestions that leading figures within the SJB would actually go and work with Ranil Vikramasinghe in a cabinet as independent members, that they would not leave the SJB, but they would go with the permission of the SJB. We remain to, to see as to whether that would be the case. But if that were the case, there is every possibility that that would fatally wound the SJB because uh, Sajid Premadasa, the leader of the opposition and leader of the SJB, did send a letter saying that if these four conditions were met, that he would uh, accept the premiership. And of course, the, Prime Minister, the president has said, look, your letter came far too late. I had already promised Ranil Vikramasinghe the presidency. So it remains to be seen as to how many other parties will actually allow their members to join the cabinet of Ranil Vikramasinghe. They always have the option of saying, look, we will support you from outside. If anyone brings a vote of no confidence in you, we will vote against it. And in that way, there will be an interim government that will be in situ probably for a year. This is very interesting. He could get support on an independent person-to-person -person basis from members of Premadasa's SJB. Could he similarly also get support on an independent person-to-person -person basis from Siri Sena's SLFP? Because if both happen, along with support from the Rajapaksa SLPP, then he could have a commanding majority behind him, even though he's a one-man party. Absolutely. Absolutely. Each of those factions can agree to join his government or alternatively to support his government without actually becoming members of it so that Sri Lanka will have a government, an interim government that will deal with the transitional crisis. And very quickly, do you think that's likely or is it only a theoretical possibility? I think it might not be the case that they will all join his government. They probably will agree to support him from outside. Which, in fact, is all that he really needs to survive a vote of confidence. Absolutely. Now, I noticed last night, shortly after he had been appointed prime minister, Matt Fry of the BBC asked him, how can you govern a country when you are a one-man party? And in answer, he compared himself to Churchill and claimed, wrongly as it is, that Churchill had had only four backers. Tell me, how does this comparison with Churchill go down in the eyes of the Sri Lankan people? Well, I think that there will always be a section of the population who thinks that that is rank arrogance to compare oneself with uh, Winston Churchill. But there are others who will say that that is typical Rani Vikramasinghe. He considers himself to be the most literate and intellectually superior of his peers as far as politics is concerned. And that, uh, you know, that is a perfect example of that. Well, I suppose a man in his very difficult situation needs a lot of self-confidence to continue. But point, let me point out something else. There's a lot of speculation, not just in Sri Lanka, but I notice on the BBC as well, that President Rajapaksa chose Ranil Vikramasinghe because he believes that Vikramasinghe will protect the Rajapaksa family. And apparently, as you pointed out yourself, during the years when he was last prime minister from 2015 to 2020, he established a reputation of protecting the Rajapaksas rather than targeting them. Do you think that's a very substantial reason why he's been chosen? The Rajapaksas feel comfortable. They view him, in quotes, as a man they can work with, a man they believe is a friend. 
Well, I think that is probably the case. But we must remember one thing, though, that the initial offer of the premiership was made to Sajid Premadasa as the leader of the opposition. And Sajid Premadasa's answer at that time was, I will not serve in a government under President Gotabe Rajpaksa. So once the president had received that answer, he says he went to Ranil Vikramasinghe, who may have always been his preferred choice, but he did go through the process of first offering it to the leader of the opposition. And if I understood an earlier answer, shortly after he'd offered the job to Vikramasinghe, Sajid Premadasa came back saying, if you can meet four conditions, Exactly. I would be, or three conditions, I would be happy to accept the job, but that was too late. By then it had already gone. Yeah, exactly. So a subplot to this story is that if Sajid Premadasa had enunciated his three conditions earlier, and they were basically that the president must step down in a limited time frame, and secondly, that Premadasa gets a free hand to handle the economic crisis, then Premadasa could have been prime minister rather than Vikramasinghe. It's just that Premadasa thought of his conditions a bit too late. Absolutely. And there would have been also the question of as to whether the SLPP majority in parliament would have agreed to those conditions, even if the president agreed to those conditions. Yeah. So oh. that might have taken much longer. Absolutely. A quick word about the president before I come to the challenges facing the new prime minister. Is President Gotabia Rajapaksa's position today, after the swearing-in of Vikramasinghe as Prime Minister, more secure than it was, say, yesterday morning? It probably is more secure, because as I said, the focus will now change or shift to the ability of the new government to get the economy back on track and to present a profile of stability as far as the country is concerned. So... That also, therefore, depends on the extent to which the protesters are willing to give this new government any time to do this, or whether they will keep insisting that, you know, irrespective of Ranil Vikramasinghe's pros and cons, Gotabe Rajpaksa must go. As regards the protests, particularly those that are around the corner from you in Golf Race Green, are they still? as full of momentum, as full of diligence as they were a few days ago, or now that a new prime minister is appointed, are they in danger of losing momentum and petering out? Well, it's a bit too early to tell, but there doesn't seem to be an abating of their enthusiasm, of their dedication to the cause that Gotabe Rajpaksa must go. So in other words, they are not in acceptance with the idea that Vikramasinghe, has, as Prime Minister, has changed the situation. They neither yeah. like him, nor do they like the oh, President. Absolutely. Let's then come to the key challenge, and I suppose the key challenge facing the Prime Minister is the economy. Now, it seems, from what I've been able to gather, that Vikramasinghe's handling of the economy when he was Prime Minister from 2015 to 2020 was not really, for everyone, hugely reassuring. I believe GDP growth collapsed from 5% to 2.9%, whilst the investment rate, the savings rate, and the government's revenue shrank as a percentage of GDP. In contrast, government debt as a percentage of GDP ballooned to 87%. So how do you view his capacity to handle the crisis? I know he's a five-time previous prime minister, but does he have the economic flair for this particular crisis? Well... All things being equal, he's probably the only politician who does have that. And one must remember that when he was last prime minister, he had a very uneasy relationship with the president. And also that government had to deal with the repercussions of the profligacy and rank corruption of the Mahindraj Paksa regime before that. So I think Mr. Vikramasinghe, with the right advisors, and we have... For example, advising the president, we have the former governor of the central bank. We have a professor at Georgetown University, someone who's actually working in the IMF as well. So I think he can attract the experts to sort out the problem. But it's not going to be easy because the IMF is going to come up with conditionalities which are going to make 
the suffering and the plight of the people worse. It's going to be very bit bitter medicine to be swallowed. So one of the key things that he will have to uh, uh, get agreement on is the cash transfer payments to the least well-off people so that they do not bear the disproportionate cost of adjustment to the new situation. Last time you spoke to me, which is, I think, exactly a week ago, you said one of the great skills needed would be communication. Passing a message to the Sri Lankan people that there is a lot of bitter medicine to swallow, and if they're not prepared for it, the country won't recover. Does Ranil Vikramasinghe have that communication skill? No. The short answer is no, he doesn't. And that is also probably one of the reasons why he lost the last general election so badly. So he has to learn from that and have a very good media team as well, both on social media as well as on mainstream media, who will communicate with the people, who will try to carry them along with them and also thereby enhance his legitimacy and credibility as a prime minister. Now, two days ago, the governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, Nandalal Virasinghe, said, and I'm quoting him, if there is no government in the next two days, the economy will completely collapse and no one will be able to save it. He also said, I will resign if there is no immediate action to form a government. Now, that government, at least in the shape and form of a prime minister, has been appointed and it's happened within those two days. But do you think as far as the central bank governor is concerned, he will be satisfied and reassured that Vikrama Singer, with his experience, is the right man? Or do you think the central bank governor's concerns will continue? Well, I think the central bank's governor's concerns will not continue in that we've now got a stable government. And he has worked with Vikrama Singer in the past. He has worked with the former governor of the central bank, who is an advisor to the president in the context of negotiations with the IMF. So Dr. Virasinghe perhaps will be more satisfied that things are moving in the right direction. The other party that matters critically to what happens to Sri Lanka economically is the IMF. Would the IMF be happier to have a Vikram Asinga who they've known and dealt with in the past than a Sajid Premadasa, who I imagine is an unknown entity for the IMF? Well, I mean, as far as uh, Ranil Vikramasinghe is concerned, you're right. I mean, they've known him, they've dealt with him in the past. I don't know as to what precisely their attitude would have been to a uh, Sajid Premadasa-led government, but that Sajid Premadasa-led government would have had people who would have been in the United National Party government under Ranil Vikramasinghe, who had dealt with the IMF in the past. So in terms of a team, uh, they, the IMF should not have been, should not been dissatisfied with having to deal with the government under Sajid Premadas. The key political challenge facing the new prime minister, of course, is the abolition of the executive presidency. And that, in Sri Lankan terms, means bringing back into power the 19th Amendment and revoking the 20th Amendment, which undermined the 19th. Given that the 19th Amendment was passed by Ranella Vikramasinghe, am I right in assuming this is a challenge he would be very adept at handling? Well, one hopes so, because if he doesn't do that at the very least, then the government that he heads is going to get into problems, particularly with the protesters and with the rest of the country. At the very least, we have to get a version of the 19th Amendment back and we have to move towards the abolition of the executive presidency. I think those are non-negotiable positions of the protesters and of the rest of the country who are backing them. What sort of cabinet appointments are you hoping Vikrama Singer will make? If they are MPs, every single one would have to be from a party other than his. But do you think he might choose to bring in a very sizable number of technocrats and experts? Does your system allow outsiders to come in and then contest elections and become MPs within six months? Well, the only way that he can bring in outsiders is if members of parliament give up their seats and allow outsiders to become members of parliament and then become cabinet ministers. We don't have a provision which allows people who are not in parliament 
to become cabinet ministers. What's your feeling? Is there sufficient talent, particularly, particularly in terms of handling the economy and in terms of handling the messaging within parliament in other parties? Or do you think he needs at least one or two critical people? And I suppose the most important person is his finance minister. No, absolutely. There is the, well, there is the possibility that he might retain the finance ministry himself. And that then he will have advisors who are outside of parliament. He will lean on experts from outside of parliament. Because within parliament, outside of the SJB, I don't think there is anyone who has demonstrated, displayed the kind of competence that is going to be required as a Minister of Finance. So it's quite possible that Rani Rikramasinghe might retain the finance portfolio himself. Does he have the qualifications to be a good finance minister? Has he got an economics degree? Has he kept the job with him in the past? Uh, no, he hasn't. But he has been very much involved in the sort of planning and implementation and on very much been involved on the sort of technocratic side of economic development. So I don't think it's that it would be such a bad idea if he retained the finance ministry, given that there aren't that many people, as I said, outside of the SJP who are able to take that position. Is he a man capable of quick decisions? And secondly, is he a man capable of taking tough, even unpopular decisions? I think he is capable of taking tough, unpopular decisions. Uh, he doesn't, of course, have that sort of popular charisma to be able to convince people as to why those tough decisions have to be made. But he's rather someone who sort of says, you know, look, we have to do this. I'm going to do it. And let's take the consequences as they come. So his star quality, if I can use that phrase, it may be a bit inappropriate, is that he can take tough decisions, he can take them quickly. His downside is that he doesn't have that magic touch to convince people that this was the right thing to do. So he Absolutely. can do the right thing, but he may not be able to convince people it was the right thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. In which case, how much time do the people of Sri Lanka, who, as you said, are still out there protesting, how much time are they prepared to give him? Or are they prepared to give him no time at all? Well, I mean, they say that they will not go until the Rajpaksas leave. I suspect that they might give the government two or three months. But in those two or three months, given the way that the protesters have come together, there's a possibility that some of them might fall out, that they might sort of disband and go away. But on the other hand, if the policies of the new government hit and bite hard with regard to the bitter medicine that has to be taken and swallowed by the masses, then of course the protesters could increase in number. And they would say, look, this is what we want. We want someone who we can trust, who is not going to make deals and who is going to get the economy back. That is why I say that, you know, they have to recognize that whoever becomes prime minister is going to have to preside over unpopular, politically unpopular and very damaging policies with regard to the bitter medicine that has to be taken. My last yeah. two questions. Quite clearly, Ranil Vikramasinghe faces the biggest challenge of his entire political career, one that I imagine he never thought he'd ever have to face up to. But what about Mahinda Rajapaksa? I take it he's still holed up and in Chinkomali naval base. What is his future? Well, there are some people who say that, look, he might be able to come back. I mean, he's still a member of parliament. Um, he might be able to present himself as the next leader of the opposition, given that he may be able to, you know, garner the support of more than uh, the numbers that the SJB have in parliament and therefore are the opposition. Or alternatively, he will have to go into exile of some sort and hope that the Vikramasinghe government will not pursue him and that after the next general election, that a government will come into power who is willing to forget and practice forgiveness. 
Are there serious differences? Dare I say it? Is there some sort of split between Gotabia Rajapaksa and Mahinda Rajapaksa? I noticed in one of the interviews that his son, Namala Rajapaksa, gave the BBC. He accepted that there were differences of opinion, but no divisions between the brothers. I think that's about right. There are differences of opinion in terms of what needs to be done, etc. But there is no division in that the Rajapaksa dynasty has to stay in power because out of power they become extremely vulnerable, not just Gotabe Rajapaksa, Mahinda Rajapaksa and the others, to pursuit of cases in terms of financial corruption as well as the human rights violations. So in a sense, I mean, they're fighting for their political survival, literally and metaphorically. If so, they leave power, they lose impunity. So both for the prime minister, who's new, and the president, who's in a desperate situation, this is the last desperate throw of the dice. They have to hope and pray it turns up six on the top side. Absolutely. And in, in a sense, they are the sort of last representatives of the political class who the youth in protest are saying have been responsible for all of this. Thank you very much indeed. That raises the question which we leave for another day. If the two cannot restore the country back to fortune and harmony, what then? Because then indeed. there is a vacuum staring Sri Lanka in the face. A new class will have to be not just created, but voted to power to take on the job. Absolutely. I thank you very much for this interview, Dr. Sarvanamuthu. Once again, I have to tell you, it's encyclopedic. You are an opportunity for my countrymen to learn about yours, and I'm deeply grateful that you made time for me. Take care, stay thank safe, you. and God bless Sri Lanka. Thank you. Thank you.